you start recording. So it's recording now. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, I guess as a participant, you aren't, so you're probably fine. Um, but if you're super scared, I guess drop. So that's that. Uh, all right, let me pull up this deck and put that on slideshow mode too and share my screen again. Cool. Sees. <clears throat> so I'm going to give a quick, um, very quick rundown of introduction to Kubeflow um, with a deck that I found that. Hey, hey Trevor, yep. I think I'm doing the lightning talk. You were doing the introduction. I think oh, you... okay. Sorry. <laughs> good. That makes me feel good because I was going to be flying stunt on this one. So I will stop that share. Yeah. Um, so coolsies. Oh, yeah, I see them. All right, thanks so much. And so go ahead, Jimmy, take it away. All right, so thanks everyone for joining up. I'm assuming that you can actually see the screen share now. Uh, strap in, empty your brain. I'm going to load it up with 10 minutes of cube flow. Uh, we're primarily going to focus on architecture and components as much as we can cram in in the next um, 10 minutes. The name's Jimmy Guerrero. That's the name they gave me. I do developer relations here at Ricto. Formerly, I was an early employee at MySQL, Red Hat OpenShift, and Influx Data. So I've been there, I've been there, I guess since the dinosaurs roamed the earth, I'm super excited about what's happening in machine learning, specifically what's going on with Kubeflow. So let's tackle a few things super, super quick here. What is Kubeflow? But before we answer that question, let's answer the probably more pertinent question, which is going to be, what does machine learning and data science have to do with Kubernetes anyway, right? It's kind of the whole premise for Kubeflow, but why don't we just do data science on our laptops? Why don't we just do it uh, on VMs? Why don't we just do it on instances in the cloud? Why overcomplicate things with bringing Kubernetes into the mix? Well, there's three really good reasons why you should consider running your machine learning workloads on Kubernetes. The first one's gonna be portability, right? The common refrain here is, I don't know, it worked on my laptop. I don't understand why it doesn't work on this Jumbotron cluster up in the cloud that runs on GPUs, right? This is the idea around Kubernetes is that you can degree, you can achieve a higher degree of portability where you know that if it runs on Kubernetes, whether it be locally or on bare metal, um, or, or I should say whether Kubernetes runs in any environment, whether it be the cloud, the laptop, uh, or, on, uh, or in other environments, essentially you can take that workload because the, the Kubernetes piece is what makes it portable as well. The other one is that normally a fully realized production machine learning workflow is going to interact with a lot of different services, whether it be on the training side, whether it be on the development side, uh, whether it be on the serving side or the tuning side, the multi-step pipeline, the monitoring, right? There's a bunch of services that are going to come into play. And oftentimes, these are going to be designed in a microservices type of style, right? Cloud native. And we all know that Kubernetes and microservices are a bit of a match uh, made in heaven, right? And Kubeflow is, is going to be something here that you can very much think of the variety of components that are inside of it as being a microservices-based architecture. The third reason why you should seriously consider Kubernetes as infrastructure on which to run your machine learning workflows is going to be scaling. And here it's not so much about scaling up, right? Everybody needs resources when they run their training experiments. But from my from what my experience is that no matter how well healed a company is, there very rarely is a one-to-one -one mapping between a data scientist and exclusive uh, access to things like GPUs, which we know are very, very expensive. So it becomes paramount, not only that you get access to the resources that you need to run your training experiments, but also that you can release those resources so that others can use them um, as well. So Kubernetes is a great facilitator for being able to do that, scale up, but as well as scaling down. So those are three reasons why you should consider running your data science and machine learning workflows on top of Kubernetes. So what if that all sounds good on paper, where does the rubber meet the road? Well, when machine learning and Kubernetes come together, the logical output is going to be Kubeflow, right? With the idea being that Kubeflow is a complete toolkit, right? So here we're not talking about Kubeflow as a point solution. It does model development, it does training, it does serving, it does artifact management, it does monitoring, it does security. It does all those things, right? And that's kind of the idea is that you wanna have a single platform where you can accomplish all those different activities that you need to do from beginning to end, from model development to actually uh, serving the thing out 
uh, for others to use. It was the, the quick history lesson on this is that it was launched publicly back in 2017 by Google. They originally started the project as a way to run their TensorFlow projects. And for those of you who care about all things open source like me, it's Apache 2.0 license. Now let's look at it from a different angle, which is, all right, maybe this all sounds good, but why don't we just use best of breed solutions, right? So of course, in a fully realized machine learning uh, workflow, there's a bunch of stuff that we got to do, right? We've got to develop our models. We have to train them. We then are probably going to do some auto ML. So we've got to do some hyperparameter tuning. We're then going to uh, serve the models out. There's multi-step pipelines that we have to deal with. Um, then we got to do our metadata tracking and then we have to you know, monitor and optimize the thing. And you know, the virtuous cycle repeats, right? We're constantly improving the thing. So there's nothing stopping anybody from, you know, using different components or building them themselves and then integrating them in together, right? But a lot of companies or a lot of individuals feel that, you know, spending my time trying to integrate technology that probably wasn't meant to work together is not really my core business. My core business is building models, right? That maybe I sell to insurance companies or to uh, healthcare providers or to financial institutions, what have you. And that's kind of the idea here is that if you use a platform like Kubeflow, that regardless of what your role is, right, in bringing a model to production, whether you're the data engineer that helps get helps a data scientist get access to the data that they need, or a data scientist that's developing the models, or a DevOps person that's trying to help productionize the code that the data scientist needs to bring the model to production, or a security person, right, that's trying to make sure that everything is on is on the up and up. The idea with Kubeflow is that it's got technology and components that everybody, no matter what your responsibility is in this particular workflow, that there's a tool set and there's a tool chain uh, there for you. It also creates kind of a common, common language or a common interface in which everybody um, can work in. So that's the upside, right, of thinking about running data science and machine learning workflows on Kubernetes, thinking about Kubeflow, and then what the advantages are of going with kind of a, a complete toolkit versus trying to cobble a bunch of stuff together. And the last point on this is that you'll probably notice is that a lot of the technologies that are at the top of the slide are actually first class citizens and integrated inside of Kubeflow. For example, our, the Argo workflow engine or TensorBoard or RStudio or Jupyter, right? These are all things that are native, natively built into Kubeflow. So again, it being open source, your integration paths are gonna be uh, a lot more open, so to speak. So let's take a look at what's actually underneath the hood of Kubeflow. Uh, granted, this is a architecture diagram, but I think for our purposes, it should suffice. What we want to zero in on are the dark blue cells in the center uh, of, the, of this uh, architecture diagram. And these are going to be your core components, right? This is going to be Kubeflow has uh, components and capabilities and features around notebooks, around how volumes are managed, uh, around operators that we use for training, uh, the auto mail capabilities, we do hyperparameter tuning and other activities like that. Your serving piece, a graphical user interface, pipelining, artifacts. So all these different components are going to be core to Kubeflow. Now, like most open source projects, it doesn't make sense to reinvent the wheel, right? Especially if you need a, a key piece of technology. So for example, um, if you need multi-user isolation inside of Kubeflow, it doesn't make sense to kind of build that from scratch. Why not just take a service mesh, which is purpose built for Kubernetes to provide that level of functionality? Or why be in the business of building a, um, a, a workflow engine when you can just use Argo? Why build a monitoring system when you can just use um, Prometheus, right? So there's a variety of different open source technologies that get bolted into your typical Kubeflow uh, distribution um, that's going to provide this sort of functionality. So again, a lot of the technology that you may already be familiar with is going to be baked into Kubeflow underneath um, the covers. And again, the whole idea here is that this all runs on top of Kubernetes, with the idea being that wherever Kubernetes can run, in theory, Kubeflow can run as well. That's the upside. So let's take a quick double click in each one of, we'll just highlight a few components. We won't go through them. We'll look at the central dashboard, which is the user interface, uh, notebook servers, pipelines, uh, the serving component, uh, the auto ML piece, and then support for training operators, right? So the central dashboard is going to be the main place where you're going to interact with the different components. 
on the left hand side in that sidebar is kind of where you see the, the key pieces of components that you're interact with, whether it be your snapshots, your volumes, your auto ML, your pipelines, your runs, your tensor boards, your notebooks, they're all going to be there, right? So it's a common user interface that folks can use to interact with these different um, components. Now, uh, the main kind of the, the first entry point that a lot of people get into after obviously they install Qflow is they want to start either importing notebooks that they already have or they want to start developing uh, notebooks. Jupyter Labs tends to be one of the more popular choices that people have when they use um, Qflow. So uh, how Jupyter Labs manifests itself inside of Qflow is we have to understand that there's a notebooks web app inside of Qflow that allows you to spin up Jupyter Lab notebook servers and Typically, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between a notebook, uh, a Jupyter notebook, and a notebook server. It, it can support multiple, but the common practice here is a one-to-one -one mapping. And the other upside here is that if you're working in, with Jupyter notebooks inside of Qflow, is that you can now easily integrate enterprise authentication and access control mechanisms that you already have probably um, at your enterprise. The other upside here is that you can create uh, notebook pods or servers directly on the Kubeflow cluster uh, with images that may have been provided by an administrator. The idea being here is that I don't have to work locally and then figure out how do I get this notebook up into that uh, cluster that's up in the cloud, right? As opposed to, I can just work directly in that cluster, right? And I can kind of mitigate that whole need to how do I migrate my notebook up there? I know that I'm working in an environment where it's going to work. Also with admins providing me these notebook images, all my dependencies and any other environmental stuff that needs to get set up can just be pre-configured with a Docker image. So I just select it and boom, I'm in a notebook interface and everything's pre-configured that I need uh, ahead of time. The other upside is that you can do single node but also distributed training jobs, right? Uh, when you work with something like notebook servers. The next piece is gonna be pipelines, right? So we've built our notebook, uh, let's run an experiment, right? So with pipelines, the idea here is that it's got a user interface, kind of as we saw on that central dashboard, there's a special tab um, just for it. And what you're able to do, or what we need to understand is that Qflow pipelines also includes an engine, right? Because we need something, right? To schedule a multi-step ML workflow. And in reality, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So here underneath the covers, what is going to be used to kind of create these multi-step pipelines is going to be Argo. Now, we also want to remember that Qflow is not just a user interface. The variety of components actually have APIs and SDKs, as you would imagine, that you can interact with. So with pipelines, there's actually two SDKs that you can interact with. There's one that's stable, that's current, that you can use to define and manipulate pipelines and components. And then there's a new one, a V2 that's in beta, that adds some kind of additional functionality around pipeline, pipeline runs as well as artifacts, uh, metadata. Okay, so we've developed our notebook, we've you know, done uh, our pipeline, we've discovered which is the best, um, the best one that we wanna use, the best model, we wanna serve it, right? So in, in the most simplistic way of thinking, model serving is just the act of making an ML model available for others to use. Others may be individuals, web services, applications, whatever it is, right? One thing to note, depending on how you're kind of moving through the Kubeflow universe is that uh, back in the early winter, late fall, uh, KF Serving was rebranded into KServe. So depending on what blog, doc, or video you watch, um, you just want to be aware that those terms may be used um, interchangeably. So what KF Serving does is that it provides basically a Kubernetes CRD, right? So for those of you coming from the Kubernetes um, world, and it's for serving ML models on a variety of different frameworks. So things like TensorFlow, XGBoo, Scikit-Learn, PyTorch, and Onyx. The idea here is that we wanna encapsulate as many of the complexities that you're gonna get with auto scaling, networking, health checking, and server configuration, all in one piece of functionality. Another thing that a lot of obviously people do when they're developing machine learning models is they wanna go down the route of auto ML, right? So, here, Qflow is going to provide a component that's baked right into it, and it's called CADIB. So what this does is that it provides the auto ML capabilities inside of Qflow. So you don't have to go outside of Qflow to get this sort of uh, functionality. So um, like KF serving, CADIB is agnostic to the machine learning framework. So you get a lot of flexibility here as far as how you want to work. The idea here is that you want to do hyperparameter tuning, early stopping, neural architecture search, in whatever language you want to work in, 
you want to be able to do that inside of um, inside of Qflow using the CAD component. And you can see we're doing all these things, and I've never actually left Qflow. I'm still inside of um, the interface. So the final word here on what are my options in regards to training operators. First, to understand in Qflow, you train machine learning models using operators. That's the nomenclature. With the 1.4 release, which was released back in October, um, all but the MPI operator have been consolidated into a unified operator. So you, there's just one operator that you work with, and it essentially has everything that you need inside of it, as long as obviously you're, you can use that functionality. So these are the, the five operators that are currently supported are TensorFlow, PyTorch, MPI, MXNet, as well as XG Boost. Now, as Trevor was mentioning, right, this all sounds fantastic. How do I get started? You basically have two paths to get to Qflow. One is you can use a package distribution. So Aricto has one, IBM has one, Amazon has one, Microsoft has one, Google has some. Some are complete, some are incomplete, some have old versions, some have the latest versions. Your mileage kind of varies a little bit depending on what package distribution you choose or you can go all in and install Qflow via manifest. Fair warning, if you install Qflow via manifest, kind of the, the hardcore Kubernetes way, um, it's for advanced users who want very specific versions of components, or they only want that component, but they don't want the other one. It's gotta be compatible with this version of SDO, et cetera. It's normally for advanced um, users. That's why 99% of people who are just getting started with Qflow that essentially just wanna to get to a user interface are going to go with a package distribution. At Aricto, we arguably have the easiest and fastest way to get started with Kubeflow, and that's with MiniKF. So essentially, it's it, it cuts out all the complexity of having to set up a bunch of Kubernetes infrastructure, and instead, we just make it super simple, right? It's a VM, right, that you host either on AWS or GCP. That's obviously got Kubernetes running on it, and then you drop Kubeflow on top of it. So it's basically a click, click, click operation um, to make it happen. The other upside is, is that there are some extensions, like there's an open source uh, KL Jupyter Lab extension that makes auto ML and pipelining super easy kind of point and click operation. Plus, if you're interested in doing data management pieces like snapshotting environments or notebooks or reconstituting whole environments to a specific pipeline step, those capabilities are all built into the mini KF package distribution. And because we know that it doesn't matter what Kubeflow distribution you go with, it's going to cost money, right? This is a lot of software that requires, you know, a bit of a bit of horsepower to actually work. So it's about 50 to 60 cents, depending on kind of what rate you're getting from AWS or Google per hour to actually run a kind of a decent sized uh, Kubeflow cluster that you can actually uh, do a little bit of development on. So at Ricto, at least through the month of March, we're offering a $25 gift certificate to, or an Amazon gift certificate or gift card um, to defray some of the hosting costs there. So all you got to do is basically sign up, install, and then once you're up and running, you'll see the link in the user interface, click on it, grab your 25 bucks. You're making money. I think that's what I'm saying, is that you're making money when you're installing um, Qflow. And as Trevor mentioned, um, if you're interested in learning more, obviously this was the, the freight train version of uh, Qflow. If you're interested in a whole series of uh, courses, 90 minute breakdowns of fundamentals, of um, how to work with the hyperparameter tuning and auto ML pieces, working with notebooks, creating pipelines, there's whole 90 minute courses that we've developed um, on those. And there's also labs and tutorials. So. If you're like, this is all great theory, but how do I get my hands dirty and actually work through some lab exercises, ericto.academy.com is the place um, to go. Also, we have workshops every single week that are kind of use case driven. So if you're interested in, okay, how do I do computer vision inside of Kubeflow? Or how do I use TensorFlow right inside of Kubeflow? Um, there's a bunch of workshops. Best place to go is just ericto.com slash events. And there's tons of stuff. I think there's at least two events happening every single week, probably for the next uh, month or two. So plenty of stuff to check out there um, if you're interested. And that's enough blabbing out of me. Um, Trevor, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Cool. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Um, so I believe our first talk is going to be... Uh, robot the robot one am i is i'm sorry i'm i'm hard time picking up my 
Yes. So, um, and is it Kostub? Kostub? Go ahead and take it away. Can you hear me? It's a bit, it's a bit choppy, I think, man. Um, can you sound off in the chat if you guys can hear me clearly? But yeah, your, your video is a little bit choppy, so maybe save on the bandwidth by killing the video. That might help. I think I have um, kind of chat that you can hear me clear. Uh, you're still breaking up a little bit. I think if you kill your video, you might save on bandwidth. Yeah, right. I've got my uh, video turned off now. So that's okay, we see the better. first slide. We see the first slide. Okay, awesome. Is my audio coming across all right? It's a little, it's a little bit better. Uh, yeah, I, I let, let's give it a go. Let's see, let's see where it goes. Let's see how it goes. Sound off in the chat if it's really bad. We'll, uh, we'll, thanks guys. Um, okay, so let's send us a quick rundown on deep learning and robotic vision. Um, it's, uh, it, I'd love to know from people if uh, anyone else has worked with robotics here in this chat. Um, would love to know what your interests are. So just sound off in the chat or in the Q&A or, or DM me. Um, would love to see what people's experiences are. Um, oh, yikes. Is this it's really not enjoying the screen share, is it? Um, okay, so essentially, who am I? I'm uh, my name is Kastub. I'm a robotics engineer with a specialism in computer vision, uh, particularly combining things like multispectral imaging as well as sonar imaging, satellite Earth observation uh, with high performance computing, right? Um, and I've in the last few years been pushing to bring deep learning onto some of these applications and looking at uh, opportunities within that space. What worked so far? What worked on the past includes uh, signal processing drones, GS signal processing, uh, optics and defect detection in the manufacturing environment, um, earth observation, uh, satellite multispectral imaging, uh, and a lot, lot of different kinds of autonomous vehicles, whether that's autonomous landing for the aircraft that fly themselves or underwater robots that can't see with anything other than essentially sonar, right? And off late, I've been looking more into cloud deployed models and data pipelining uh, using cloud infrastructure. Um, I just 
just look at the two sides of deep learning in my mind, or at least in my experience. One side is cloud ML, which a lot of people will be really familiar with, distributed connected systems and uh, mobile applications that are continuously connected and are able to serve, uh, you know, serve models remotely on a server to an application endpoint. Um, and the other side is robotics, which I've spent more of my time in. Um, I'd break down robotics into essentially two fields. Uh, and people can argue with me all the live long day about what those fields are, and there might be more fields, but essentially I break it down into automation and field robotics. Automation being warehouse automation, manufacturing robotics, uh, you know, typically what you'd expect to see in that top picture there with uh, robotic arms moving pick and place um, objects on a conveyor belt. Uh, field robotics is, uh, well, it's what a lot of people are. Uh, if you grew up watching Iron Man, this is what you would imagine robotics to be, right? Uh, is little robots that go off and do their own thing that are autonomous. We're talking about decision making and exploratory robotics, uh, space robotics, underwater robotics, things like that. Autonomous vehicles, I would classify closer to field robotics because they have a similar um, set of challenges and problems that they face. Um, so what essentially I want to do is I want to stay away from necessarily spending a lot of time in the infrastructure because there's going to be uh, you know a few dozen ways that you could use different infrastructure to get the same results what i want to impart today is a high level overview of what are the concerns with ml and robotics that you might not be um faced with within the uh, mobile development uh, side of life um and yeah just give a high level uh, overview of that and then i'll round up by um tying that back to how we can leverage some of these uh, cloud tools like Kubeflow and Kubernetes uh, in order to empower us to do this work faster and in a better way. Um, so the first thing to kind of understand is the difference between a closed world and an open world system, right? So the way that I see it, um, a closed world system is like, uh, let's say you're playing a game of tic-tac-toe, right? There's only a few specific moves that you can actually make, whereas an open world system is something like Go or chess, where it's more open world, it's entirely open, it's still got a finite set of moves and rules that you can make. A truly open world system is something where there is no finite decision space and there's no finite event or experiential space, right? So anything can happen and you can respond in any way you'd like to that situation. Right um, now, when we're talking about automation robotics, uh, it's highly replicable. It's going to be limited in terms of what it sees. You're not going to see a conveyor belt uh, making spanners suddenly have Coke bottles coming down it without them reconfiguring the whole situation. Right. So the events and states that it experiences are is quite uh, limited. Right. And they're constrained. And so the decision space can be considerably more constrained. So you don't see the adoption of uh, deep learning as much in this area. You see adoption of machine learning in terms of data analytics and understanding uh, your yield influences and things like that in automation, but not so much, uh, say, computer vision, where you might see it in bits and pieces for things like defect detection, but it's not as prevalent as in the more open world scenarios, because a lot of the problems that need to be solved in a closed world scenario don't need a highly nonlinear decision making system, right? Uh, now, within like a mobile development space, it's open world, but it's still restricted to what the app is intended to do, what the device is uh, capable of, and what the human interaction uh, aspect comes into. And obviously, a person can take a picture of tomatoes for an app that's supposed to, you know, uh, decide between cars, but that's the variation of input. So the, the event space is semi-limited, but the decision space is quite limited, right? Um, Robotics, field robotics in particular, is quite explorative. So that essentially leaves us with a much more open space of decisions. Um, you can think about it as uh, instead of making finite strong decisions, they're sometimes making weaker decisions that are more behavioral in nature, right? So um, as you get a more open world situation, you can take that question of rather than saying, hey, do I want to land here or not land here as an aircraft? I can, uh, my, my network can respond with, I'm feeling safe, proceed. I'm feeling safe, proceed. And it would continue to feed back this uh, safety rating, essentially, as it 
continues to descend, right? Uh, now that's not as hard and fast as land, okay, go for it, or don't land, go somewhere else, right? Um, so that behavioral output is often, um, often leads you down to more infinite pathways because you could end up in a slightly different location each time you try the same landing procedure, right? Um, and in this open world kind of situation, because you're essentially anything can come into, let's, let's take the scenario of an, a, a VTOL aircraft that's landing, right? Anything can come under the camera down there. It can be grass, it can be uh, rocks, it can be water, it could be a cat, it could be a cow, it could be a person in a car, right? It could be essentially anything. So that's way more open world than the kinds of things that you'd see, say, on a manufacturing line, where you need to make a decision that, hey, were all of the parts that go onto my PCB actually present or not, right? So there is an element of open world uh, infinite thinking that you have to apply to decision making within a robotic space. So I want to focus on field robotics, predominantly because that's where I've mostly worked. Um, and that's where the majority of my expertise comes in. Uh, so I'm going to focus the rest of this discussion on how do we deploy machine learning and what are the concerns for field robotics, right? So let's start with data density and availability, right? Um, data density, uh, we see similar things in, in things like genetics, uh, genetic data, like gene editing data, or you see uh, dense data in terms of like GPS, um, GPS channel information or radio waves, things like that. Uh, so data density isn't something new to robotics. What is new is that often you can't scale down resolutions and uh, compress in, in as many ways as you would usually like to, because you need to keep that data rate high as well as the data quality high in order to build a map. Essentially what we use deep learning for is to build a more semantic map of what's around us, as opposed to just saying, hey, I'm a robot, I'm moving to the left, but there is a thing to my left. I can actually perceive what is that thing? How can I interact with the thing to continue on my mission of moving left, right? So in order to do that, often we're not given the luxury of scaling down uh, the density or the resolution of our data. This could be point cloud data, this could be high resolution image data, it could be sonar. Um, so yeah, the data rate and the density of data is can often be quite a burden within the robotic space. Um, and often the availability of data is comes under question in the sense that there, there, are, there are very high degrees of unknown. Uh, let's say I'm putting a, a, a space robot on the moon or, or, or Mars or Jupiter. I have never been to Jupiter. We cannot get much data from Mars, but we can't get too much data from the moon either. We don't even have to travel that far. Now, if I send a robot down into the ocean, I don't know what the seafloor is going to look like exactly. I can give it a decent guess, but I'm not going to know to extreme levels of detail before I get there. So the data availability also becomes quite a challenge. Uh, the second thing is real time. What do we consider real time, right? We talk about responsiveness in apps. Uh, you know, if I press a button in half a second or one second, I should see, uh, you know, the, the, the response come through correctly. Now, I'm not going to notice as a human if instead of the 0.3 seconds that was promised by the app, it comes through at 0.4 seconds or 0.5 seconds, right? That 0.1 of a second doesn't make a huge difference to a human who's able to accommodate to that. Whereas when we're talking about things like level five autonomy, what I mean by level five autonomy is fully disconnected decision making, where you're able to put a robot in a situation and it's able to decide where it's going, how it should behave, how it can solve problems and continue on its mission. When we're talking about that, often a 0.01 second difference can, can mean the difference between saving the robot and letting it fall into a trench, right? Because let's say you've got 10 frames a second of image data coming through where you're able to detect danger, uh, semantic danger of within that image, right? Um, your feedback loop to your motors is a lot faster than that. You need to be able to tell it in time that, hey, there's danger coming. So you need to slow down the motors. You need to turn it back, right? So often having that responsiveness of a model is extremely important in, in, in a robotic sense, right? Um, even being off by a hundredth of a second can often cause imbalances in your system, depending on obviously on how you tune your robot, how 
the entire navigation um, package of your robot is designed, right? Um, and we see that with a lot of walking robots where balance is an issue. Um, we see that a lot with underwater robots or with aerial vehicles that can lose control and, and fall out of the sky. We don't see it as much with ground robots because they can just stop as a default action. It's quite an easy solution. But yeah, um, you will see situations like this where the real-time nature of autonomous systems is a lot more uh, granular than other systems. Uh, connectivity is another issue. Now, uh, autonomous ground vehicles, AGVs, or unmanned aerial vehicles, um, they typically have high connectivity into satellite systems. But what if your UAV is flying extremely high? You're maybe not going to get the cell tower um, data that you need to remain connected to the network. Right? Let's go even worse. Let's uh, let's send a robot into space, or well, let's put a robot under the water. You're not getting internet underwater, right? So one of the big challenges is how do you make decision making quick and give that power to the robot itself? You can't sit there with a joystick anymore if it takes eight seconds to get a command across to a robot sitting on the moon, right? By then the robot would have crashed. You can't. You physically can't get any data back and forth from an underwater robot without it surfacing. Uh, so how do you get models to run? You can't exactly you know, make an endpoint in the cloud and then get this robot to hit that endpoint. It's got to be on board. So we start seeing issues like that play uh, into the way in which we design ML for robotics. Right? So that leads me to this situation. We're now talking about onboard computing. What are the limitations on onboard, uh, onboard computing? Essentially, you've got an energy trade-off limitation. Your robot's only got so much battery power, uh, you know, or if it's got an engine, engine power, right? It's only got so much energy that it can store at any given time. So you can have the most, you know, powerful array of GPUs on that robot, but the weight is going to play into a factor that's going to slow it down and make it less energy, um, uh, energy friendly, and it would essentially shorten the lifespan of the mission. So you have to trade off the physical limitations of having compute on board with what's essential to getting the job done on robotics. And that's something that we often don't see when we have fully horizontal, horizontally scalable systems, right? We're not afforded as much of that luxury when we're talking about remote robotics that's you know disconnected from the world. Um, and the other side of it is also deployment flexibility is limited. Obviously, you don't, you know, you can't spin up another instance as easily. Uh, you can't manage instances remotely. You can't debug things remotely. So there's a lot of flexibility lost in that sense. Um, I'm sure there will be some innovative changes in the next decade or so, where we'll start to see, uh, you know, more self-healing systems that are focused on the robotics use case. Um, uh, but we'll see where that leads us. Let's talk about tools of the trade, right? So. Now, we're used to deploying our models to endpoints that are called within apps. Uh, that's pretty much run of the mill at this point. Loads of people are doing that. But robotics has developed its own need for its own middleware so that it can interface between uh, different components, right? So that I don't have to go and write a, a motor driver for every single motor that I use for my robot. Right? I can abstract things away with the, essentially a PubSub node-based system where you'd have a driver for a particular piece of hardware that would, would communicate in essentially a known uh, messaging standard through ROS or Moose, both of which are essentially um, middleware systems. Right? They, they essentially just pass data along. So how do we fit in a machine learning um, module with this? That's going to be the question. So sorry, just for context, that also means your cameras, all of your peripherals, right? So your camera would have a ROS node, for example, that connects to the camera that will capture the images and will send it as a message onto your uh, onto your bus, onto your messaging bus, right? Um, and then you would have another node that's processing that data by taking that data in from by subscribing to the topic and then uh, performing whatever uh, inference you want on it. When we're Integrating ROS with Moose, I've seen essentially this is a pattern that I've seen um, teams go through. A lot of robotics teams are small and R&D type teams, typically in universities, typically in small startups, and they 
need to move fast and don't necessarily have the full breadth of skills around uh, Kubernetes, Kubeflow, managing deployments and clusters. So the quickest way for them, and frankly, I've done that, I've done this myself in the past, the quickest way for me was to write a ROS mode that would import my PyTorch uh, model and would infer on it within ROS. So I've had a ROS inference node essentially, right? Um, now this isn't exactly scalable across a, across a fleet of robots, uh, nor is it particularly uh, modular in the sense that if I need to change my model, I need to change my actual node. I need to actually update the code in my node itself. Um, on the other hand, as uh, as I matured that system at, at a previous workplace, um, I found that containerizing the training helped me uh, boost the training rate, but I still kept the direct in-node inference purely because that was easy and I didn't have to manage deployments. Now, this is typical in like a one-man army kind of situation, right? Like uh, I'm the only ML engineer there. Everybody else is focused on the other aspects of building the robot. Now, as that scales, what I started to plan out and map out for them was how do you use Dockerized models on board the robot? So you could use essentially a Kubernetes cluster within uh, hosted on your robot with exposed NPR, uh, uh, with exposed endpoints uh, to your model and a ROS or Moose node that just hits that particular endpoint. So if I need to now go and build the same thing, I would have all of my training rather than happening, uh, rather than running all my training on local huge GPUs, which I was lucky enough to have, um, I would essentially leverage GCP or AWS and use Kubeflow pipelines to run all my, uh, you know, data pipelining and then my training pipelines, uh, model evaluation experiments, do all of that. And then if I can serve this uh, Docker container as my, um, as essentially my doc, my containerized model, I can then run that on board the um, on board the robot itself, and then the ROS and Moose nodes would just hit that endpoint. It would be essentially the same thing as hitting an endpoint in the cloud, except it's hosted locally. Now, this strategy it may or may not work depending on the robot, right? It depends on how connected your robot is. Your robot may only need to work in you know five G authenticated areas, so it's able to communicate, so it doesn't need this, right? But if your robot's underwater, I don't think you have much of a choice, right? Uh, this this is the this is the kind of vision that I saw was this is the right way that we can bring the best practices of cloud um, cloud ops in terms of training and data pipelining, but also maintain that um, the essential needs for robotics where it's able to run locally. Um, and often that there's a disconnect between the two worlds because those skills haven't uh, converged yet. It's getting there, and I think over the next five years we're going to see more people from the cloud infrastructure world enter into the robotic space and, and transfer some knowledge in there. And you're seeing people like myself um, leave the robotic space, um, as I've done in the last six months, leave the robotic space to go and explore the cloud space uh, so that I can bring back some of these learnings, right? So the cross-pollination and convergence of knowledge is coming, but still a ways off. And obviously the engineering development cycle, right? Now, if you're all software engineers and you're making an app, a, a deployment, and you know, training models, we've already seen the confusion between the front end and back end engineers operate in this manner for their deployments, but ML engineers and, and, and data scientists work in a slightly different cadence, slightly different manner in terms of experimentation, um, feature branches, the way in which you deploy, the way in which you stage your testing environments. Um, there's a lot of detailed differences there. Now, take that and add to that a mechanical engineering team, an electronics engineering team, uh, and a systems engineering team, right? Um, and essentially, it just gets way more complicated, right? Hardware design processes aren't very reversible. Uh, so once you design like the mount, and this is where the sensors go, it's already spec'd out for the sensors. So you can't really change that, right? Once you've made those decisions, it's very hard to reverse it, especially because if you look at a state of the art, just LiDAR, radar, IMU system, I've seen that cost a quarter of a million Australian dollars, right? Uh, these sensors are not cheap sensors and it's really quite difficult to make them any cheaper. Um, and it's really quite difficult to buy them any cheaper as well. So that's one of the falling points of fitting this into an engineering development cycle 
that's more multidisciplinary and has more moving parts to it than a strictly software deployment, right? And this is where simulated uh, development comes into play. What if without having to design the mechanics of the actual, um, without having to design physically the, the robot itself, what if we can go from CAD, uh, CAD prototypes uh, into, uh, into high fidelity simulation environments, right? And then can experiment with different sensor positionings, different mountings, different kinds of sensors, uh, and see what we can get out of that to see, okay, these are the challenges we're gonna to need to solve with this robot in this environment. Here's the sensor package I would recommend for this. Um, so that this really helps in the process. Um, and this is essentially what we were doing is, pro, is we would take teams that were looking at their own chassis and their own aircraft, and we would uh, kit it out with their sensors. Um, and essentially the crux of that came down to can you make physics real simulations? Because if your radar simulation is off or your sonar simulation is off, or even your, your camera optic simulation is off, the lighting of the environment is wrong, uh, the model quality is you know low fidelity or low poly, um, this is, you really start to see the, the conflation of um, game engine technologies, of CUDA programming, of, you know, sensing technologies, you really need a plethora of experts in that space to get simulations at a high enough fidelity to make this actually useful. Uh, so it's quite a high, high capital area to enter uh, the robotic space really in, in this day and age. But as time goes on, I'm sure that will solve itself. Um, and obviously, yes, it will be bound to slow down because you're not going to stay in the simulation stage all, all the time. Eventually, you're going to have to lock it down and say, okay, this is our chassis. This is how much we can carry as a payload. So this is how much you can have the sensors. You know, you can't just say, oh, I need this different sensor. It's four kilos more. And that's just going to bring your aircraft down, right? So uh, eventually, you will get bound to those hardware design decisions. Um, so it's still an open question how multidisciplinary teams work. Um, that's always been the case. Always, I mean, we'll find bigger and better different ways of working. But um, yeah, it's still a problem that's solved differently by different teams, let's say. So it's an open question. So this is how I would not do a field robotics ML stack. Design in CAD, simulate in, in a game engine, and then write your own custom data pipelines in Python, and then grab some real world data, put that through its own pipelines as well in Python, train it in a Dockerized container with, uh, you know, PyTorch, TensorFlow, whatever the flavor of the month is for you, and then deploy it directly onto, you know, your ROS node, which is written in Python or C++. Um, and it'll be a combination of post, pre and post processing in C++ and Python for the inference alone. Um, I've done it this way. It works for proof of concepts, but it's definitely not an efficient way to do this. Um, and the scalability and, and the robustness of delivery, especially when you're working across multiple proof of concepts, just improves in a, a whole lot way a whole lot more when you can uh, you know leverage things like version pipelines that kubeflow comes you know you have kubeflow pipelines you can version your kubeflow pipelines excellent move on don't try to reinvent the wheel been there done that and i made a really cut down version of it and it's really not scalable you know um so this is essentially what i would do is yeah design in cad simulate in game engine uh, collect whatever real world data you can, develop your um, data pipelines and training pipelines in a cloud based service. That also allows you to delay the decision on how much computational power you actually need on, on board the robot. Right now, if I can simulate this and I can, um, you know, train models and deploy models on, on different GPUs, profile, profile the memory usage, profile the, uh, you know, inference time, and then really optimize my model. I can actually get to a point where I can almost spec and say, you know what, I need exactly this much memory and this much compute power in order for this model to run at the rates we need. And then you can spec out the computational requirements of your robot itself, right? So often you'll find that uh, robotics teams will just get the biggest stinking heap of uh, GPU that they can grab and put it on the back of a robot and then just say, yep, that should take care of most of it. Um, but it's really not cost efficient. It's really not, uh, it's, it's, it just lacks that engineering discipline of actually specking out what's actually required, right? Um, so yeah, 
that's essentially it. And I would, like I said, I would, I would use a locally hosted Kubernetes cluster uh, with containerized models and a Python or a C++ endpoint that just calls it. Um, and yeah, that's essentially how I would do that. That's why super brief rundown on the concerns of robotics and, and how deep learning can be deployed on for robotics. Um, and some of the interesting things that I've seen along the way in the last few years. Uh, open for any questions or in the Q&A. Um, but yeah, thank you. <clears throat> awesome. That was a really, really interesting talk. Thanks so much. Uh, cool stuff. Again, ask questions uh, in the Q&A thing, not the chat screen, please. And um, I think we can just let uh, our next speaker go ahead and talk. And if there's questions, we can continue to chat those out in the Q&A section in the meantime. And thank you again. Mom, so if you're talking, you're on mute still. Uh, yes, uh, I'm just uh, starting to share my screen and I'll start. Sorry, I have not turned on my video, but is it fine without the video or? Oh, okay. I think it looks So hello everyone. Today I will talk about porting signal processing algorithms to QPy for precision measurement. So this talk is a bit different and it's more associated with high performance computing, but I'm definitely looking forward to understand the use case of Kubeflow and maybe I can adopt it for this process as well. So first of all, I would like to thank all the people associated with this project because uh, it's been a multidisciplinary project which involved uh, expertise from optics, physics, and electronics as well. So here is the outline of my talk. So as I mentioned in my title that it's about precision measurement. So one of the technique which is used here is frequency scanning interferometry system. So here I will briefly describe what this system is and how it works. And then the role of signal processing in frequency scanning interferometry system. And then how we are developing these algorithms using QPy. And in the end, my final thoughts about the process and the project. So frequency scanning interferometry system is basically a precision measurement technique in which you have a source, which is a laser source, and the target, which are reflective targets, which are either made of retro reflectors or uh, glass balls. So we use this technique to, or we are planning to actually use this technique to monitor the components which are inside a cryostat. So what happens in accelerators, we have superconducting magnets and trap cavities, uh, which are actually stored at a very low temperature and high radiation condition. And they are inside a cryostat, which you can see on the left. And we want to know the position of these components. And, and later also to align these. And it's not possible to actually get this, this position up to micrometer precision with the usual sensors. And hence uh, this technique was devised. So on the left, you can see it's a laser source. So this is the source and inside it, which is not visible uh, are the reflective targets. So based on these uh, source and the target uh, using this technique, we try to know at what distance our component is lying and, and then there is another feedback system or uh, the system which you can see here, it's a Sambuca system which actually corrects the position. So the stock mostly focuses on detecting the position uh, of the system. So 
A frequency scanning interferometry system is basically based on Michelson interferometer interferometry principle. It's uh, more associated with the physics. So what happens, uh, you have a laser source and a beam splitter. So this laser source is split into two parts. One is called as the reference and one is called as a one which goes to your target. So, and then what happens, 4% uh, of the uh, source is, goes to the reference and rest 96% goes to the target. And at the photo detection, once these the source is reflected back at the detection site, you receive both the signal and these both the signals are actually interference, but there is a time lag or there is a delay between the two signals, which apparently helps to identify at what distance my target is. So when you get the combination of these two signals, which we call as a interference, uh, and uh, it is represented by this equation. It's a, a cosine wave. And here, the time delay between the two signal can is used to identify the distance. And here, uh, basically, initially, most of the time, it is, a, it is a fixed laser source, but it is not very practical to use a fixed laser source. So here, we use a sweeping laser source. And we have to know at what rate the laser is sweeping. So this is the very standard mechanism or a ideal principle of uh, having an interferometer system. Uh, but here we are using a optical circulator and, a, and for reference, we use a fiber ferrol tip to, uh, to consider it as at a known distance. And the unknown distance is our target, which is the retro reflector surface, which we put on our devices or the magnet just to know, okay, at what distance they are. So with this equation, we can actually calculate uh, exactly the unknown distance. And to know more about this, at the all the principle behind uh, FSI, you can actually refer to this presentation. But uh, since we cannot work with just one target, we have, because these systems are quite big and we need multiple targets. So the idea was to go with the multiple target frequency scanning system. So instead of just having one target, the, the signal which is detected on the photo detect detection side is actually the combination of uh, multiple targets and it's represented by this equation. So with the so to deal with these multiple targets, we cannot deal much in the time domain signal. So we have to convert it into the frequency domain. And it is much more easier when you do the Fourier transform of the combined signal, and which each of the distinct distance we have a unique frequency. And when we know the alpha rate, or uh, that is the sweep rate of the laser, we can actually determine the distance of all our unknown targets. So that was the most ideal deployment, but how this has to be done in, the, in, in a practical way. So what we have done here, uh, since we don't know it, uh, we need to know at what rate the laser is sweeping when we are trying to know the distance. So here, HCM gas cell is used. So, uh, so what happens, we pass this laser source through this gas cell uh, and uh, how this, uh, the absorption of the laser happens across this gas cell, we exactly get to know at what rate the laser is sweeping. And also we have a reference interferometer system for which we actually know at what distance it is. And after that, for all the different targets, we, we call them as a measurement channel and we don't know at what distance they are. So based on all these, we have one equation where we know the length and we also know the sweeping rate. And we also know the sweeping rate as well. And then the other equation where we have multiple different targets and we don't know at what distance it is. And if you relate these two equations, we can actually identify the unknown distances. So that was the more of the basic principle behind the system and how, and based on the optics it is. But 
the actual system when we have to work with a, a large amount of points. For example, I can say they like for a, for the practical use case, there are thousands of targets, and we need to know the distance within one second. So here is the hardware which was designed and decided. And uh, since it is a proof of concept initially, so there are going to be more possible changes. So more closer to our target system, we have a measurement chassis where we host our all the photo detection modules. <coughs> and then these photo detection module actually acquire these signals through fiber and, uh, and, and these are upstream to the server where we have a GPU. And this GPU is basically responsible for doing all the calculations in real time. These are some of the lab setups, uh, which you can see they're not very clean, but these were like a proof of concept we were working on. So next I would like to talk about where, what role signal processing plays in the system. So here uh, on my right side, you can see uh, the, the entire process taking place in within one second, uh, right from acquisition of data and, uh, and then transferring it to the server side. So our main focus here is on the GPU side where we have to deal with the raw data and uh, get exactly the final distance based on the equations that I mentioned previously. So here is the more detailed view of what is happening on the algorithm side. So we have basically three kinds of channels. As I mentioned, we need the reference channel and the gas channel to know the alpha rate and uh, already and to know a known distance so that we can actually identify the unknown distance which we acquire through these rest of the 62 measurement channels. And this happens actually in three stages where uh, we get the reference signal and we need to actually filter this signal and then uh, use the parameters of the signal to first linearize the gas cell and the measurement channel data and then uh, use this to identify the distance. So this is a, in a bit in more detail. So what happens, you have your reference cell data. It has to be filtered through Butterworth filter uh, for, a, for a cutoff frequency because uh, we, we know we want to acquire signal at the particular frequencies and uh, to actually ease the calculation as well. And then with this reference signal, we need to know certain parameters like instantaneous phase and instantaneous frequency, and then uh, use these parameters for our gas cell and the measurement measurement channel to know at a particular stamp or at what time we are actually looking for to identify the distance. So this is how exactly this raw signal looks like. It is approximately 2.5 million data points. And uh, this is the uh, raw gas cell, which is, uh, which is actually uh, obtained after like passing the laser through HCN gas cell. And it is mostly the uh, spectrum of hydrogen cyanide gas. So how we are using a QPI for achieving all these signal uh, different blocks of signal processing. And so here I would like to highlight a bit about QPI and then uh, more about how the algorithms were actually ported in QPI uh, so that we can leverage the use of GPU for signal processing and also uh, attain our goal to have all the processing within one second. So QPI is uh, basically a open source library, which is kind of a wrapper around all the CUDA functionalities, all the CUDA libraries. So uh, it actually uh, uses the underneath uh, use cases at, which are provided by the NVIDIA uh, under the CUDA. Uh, you can directly uh, use QFFT, you can leverage the functionalities of QFFT or uh, Q linear algebra and also uh, use uh, develop your own customized kernels as well. And uh, it also like 
provides high performance and dimensional array computation, similar to NumPy as well. And also QPy is very easy to start with because pretty much most of the things are quite similar to NumPy. And definitely it's a open source, so you can actually contribute back to the community and also check the source code and do the modifications as per your need as also. And it is very easy to start with. So if uh, you are starting with the signal processing and you want to scale it up to the GPU level and you have a time constraint, uh, then, uh, and you are using to start more with the Python. So I, I think it is more easier to start and also to test your uh, prototype and proof of concept as well. So what is provided in QPy for signal processing? So uh, like with Python, we have this SciPy package, which completes almost all the algorithms and basic functionalities to develop any of the signal processing algorithms. Uh, in QPy, we have support for FFT. We can do linear decomposition. We can do a lot of image processing. We can do convolution. But still a lot of things are missing. But these components also help in, like they can be used as a building blocks to uh, develop new algorithms. And there is another interesting bit with the QPy. Uh, QPy and CUDA is, uh, there is a specific project under Rapids uh, for QSignal. So uh, they are actually using, again, QPy to develop uh, signal processing algorithms and to also uh, improve their performance. So there are a few of the considerations I was looking into when I wanted to port this algorithm to GPU. So first we have developed and tested it on CPU, but since we had constraint of using thousands of channels plus uh, processing time has to be within one second. So we decided to go with the GPU. So for moving to GPU, what I did was to first check what data format we have because uh, GPU support with float 64 and float 32. So it's very important to decide on your data format and then proceed ahead. Then uh, one of the things which makes a lot of delay or consumes more time is the amount of time needed in, in copying your data between CPU and GPU, which we call as device to host and host to device memory transactions. And also a lot of, uh, algorithms have recursive functions in them, and it is better not to use recursive functions uh, with GPUs. And also, uh, you have to check whether how much your algorithm can be parallelized and uh, how much uh, possibility you have with the GPU. Now I would like to highlight about how I ported some of the very common signal processing algorithms and which are not actually yet present in the uh, QPy library and QSignal as well. So first I would like to talk about Butterworth filter. So in signal processing uh, to suppress uh, some part of the signal up to certain frequency, we use filters. And the range which is allowed is called as passband and which is suppressed is called stopband. So Butterworth filter is a IIR filter and it provides the maximum flat response. So here you can see the range which is allowed for this low pass filter has no ripples and that's why it is more preferred. And a filter is represented in a transfer function and where we define a cutoff frequency and the order of filter as well. So, uh, which is, which actually determines how your filter is represented in terms of polynomial uh, in a B by A form, uh, either as a Laplace transform or a uh, Z transform. So here you can see it's a low pass filter where we have cutoff frequency around 3.75. And if I provide a very noisy signal, it is uh, filtered up to this frequency and rest of the components are ignored. So in our system, we needed Butterworth high pass filter. And for this, the algorithm is pretty much similar to SciPy and MATLAB, the standard uh, signal processing algorithm. So 
to implement any digital filter, first you have to prepare an analog prototype of it and then uh, convert that analog to analog filter to if it's actually by default, most of the time it's low pass filter you first create and then you move it to high pass or band pass filter uh, and then uh, you can actually convert this analog filter to the digital filter. So here, first we define zeros, poles, and gain of a filter. And zeros and poles uh, basically define the stability of any system. And here, uh, since it's a uh, very uh, stable and with less ripple filter, so here we don't have any zeros. That is a that is the equation or the polynomial in the numerator is just one and uh, we just have poles which define the stability of this filter and then we because um, the relation between analog frequencies and digital frequency has to be uh, uh, defined so we use a pre warping technique where we convert uh, analog frequencies to digital frequency and then we convert uh, this to a digital filter by using bilinear transformation, which is uh, converting it from Laplace transform to Z transform. And then you can uh, get the equation of your filter in a B by A form, which are nothing but the coefficients of your polynomial, uh, polynomial representing numerator and uh, denominator. And these are in the form of vector. So here, basically what a high pass filter look like which actually passes a frequency which you define all the components after a certain cutoff frequency so then uh, the thing is uh, it is also possible to create the filter on the cpu side but we want to apply this filter on a massive data set or a massive data point so the idea was either to use l filter or the linear filter or a FFT transform. But since with QPy, there is a very fast implementation of FFT. So the idea is to actually apply this butter filter on just one delta signal, that is just a one value, and then uh, do the element-wise uh, multiplication with your uh, actual signal. And here is a, a performance analysis of for 2.5 data points when this filter is applied on GPU, uh, applied when the data is stored on GPU and the filter is created already on GPU as well. Next, I would like to talk about Hilbert transform. So uh, what happens when we have a real-time signal? If we do a normal fast Fourier transform, we have a very linear relation between phase and frequency. And if we want to know the instantaneous attributes of any time series, we need to go through Hilbert transform. And in Hilbert transform, what, it, what happens, it actually shifts your signal by 90 degree, a 90 degree phase shift to actually know the instantaneous frequency, which we call as a analytic signal. So here it is again, we are using a uh, fast Fourier transform to, uh, to, to, to do the first fast Fourier transform of first of our time-based signal, then to a 90 degree phase shift of the signal, and then again to the inverse Fourier transform. So in this way, we can actually know the instantaneous frequency and phase and use these parameters to apply to our rest of the signals, which need to be linearized, same as the reference signal, because we want to know at a particular timestamp, they have to be same, to have to have them in a particular frequency domain and timestamp as well. So this is how the performance of the Hilbert transform was kind of compared, uh, where I compared with, with the time timing of the implementation on GPU and timing on CPU. And it's, it's drastically different, uh, specifically because of the fast implementation of fast Fourier transform. And here you can see, uh, it is one of the example where uh, you can see a phase change uh, after the uh, Hilbert transform, it is completely 90 degree out of phase the other signal. So the other thing uh, to to improve or to actually monitor whether the 
uh, algorithm which I'm trying to adopt to GPU is uh, good or not. So I was using uh, NVIDIA Insight systems to actually know how much time it is taking for each of the kernel associated to work. And also in between, you can also check how the memory transactions are happening and to avoid multiple uh, multiple uh, copying between CPU and GPU in between the computation. So next I would like to talk about savitsky gole filter. So I think this filter is pretty much more common even with the data, data analyst because uh, at some point we need to smooth the data. So this filter actually uh, provides a smoother data uh, by keeping the tendency of the signal is not much disturbed. And uh, it is done by using a least square fit method. So for a particular window size, we actually try to fit a polynomial from for a particular set of points. And since if our data is very equally spaced, we can actually get these polynomial coefficients and directly uh, convolve it with the entire signal. So this is how it was implemented in QPy. So first we decide a window range or depending on the order of the filter, you can uh, create your polynomial passing through certain number of points and then uh, convolve it directly with the actual signal. So this is how the savitsky gole filter fits in this algorithm. And it was used basically for uh, smoothing the gas cell data because we get a lot of noise floor with this data. And since here it is not very much visible, but we needed to actually identify the peaks and for which we this uh, filter was used to at least get a much better and smooth data. And this is the analysis or uh, the time comparison of savitsky gole filter. And you can see the difference for the window size that is 201 points we have taken and considering a polynomial of order two. So the same, as I mentioned, uh, I use again the N NVIDIA Insights profile system to, uh, to see how my algorithm is working. And, uh, and the, one of the most uh, visible things specifically with this algorithm was the copy pasting and uh, between uh, CPU and GPU. So I try to avoid them uh, and uh, and yes, you can also use the command, command line version as well, where you can see actually uh, how different kernels are working uh, underlined with the QPy. So uh, we also need to do the peak detection for the gas cell to ultimately identify the alpha rate because we have a known gas cell spectrum and then one we get after passing the laser source through this HCN and we want to fit it with the uh, actual one. So to identify some of the peaks and the corresponding wavelength, since there is no find peaks kind of function in QPy yet, so uh, the idea was to implement a very simple algorithm on GPU where we just identify a peak based on a threshold value uh, provided and, uh, and uh, mark it directly on the, cell, uh, on the uh, spectrum of the signal. So here are some more signal processing routines that I compared for our huge data sets. Uh, mostly from the uh, NumPy as well. And there is a quite a good difference and, and it actually justifies the use of GPU if we have to deal with this massive data set with uh, limited time. Uh, since you, you might have heard fast Fourier transform multiple times in the previous uh, uh, description of the algorithms. So, What's the best with QPy is you get a very nice implementation of FFT, and it is actually using the CUDA FFT, FFT, and it also provides a lot of flexibility, like you can actually check the underlying routines inside QFFT, which are basically in C, uh, sorry, in uh, C in CUDA, but you can actually uh, also access it through 
directly calling these routines from QPy because it's kind of a wrapper around it and it, it's very fast. Like you can actually change how you want your FFT to be calculated. So that was all about the use case of QPy in signal processing. And I hope you might have heard of a lot of uh, physics and uh, interferometry terms as well. So QPy apparently is a very good library to start with, specifically if you are considering GPUs to be used for signal processing. And uh, since this is a proof of concept or prototype, which will be actually deployed in 2025. So we are trying to improve the performance and do multiple analysis and uh, get the desired effect within one second. And and trying to move more of these algorithms where I'm directly using the functionalities from QPy to actually make it more faster by creating the custom kernels. And also, since some of these doesn't are not present in the mainline QPy repository, I'm looking forward to contribute it back as well. Actually, I contacted them and I'm in contact with the QSignal community as well to uh, push these changes so that anyone who wants to use CUDA and GPUs for signal processing can directly uh, refer this. So that was all about it. Thank you. Awesome talk. Actually, two awesome high quality talks. Amazing. Thank you so much to uh, all of our, both of our presenters. Um, uh, one sec. Costs. Uh, Kostu uh, had a question and I guess the Q and A didn't work. So I'm gonna hand over to him to ask real quick. And um, yeah, thanks Trevor. Um, hey Mamta, that was a great um, presentation. Uh, really interesting stuff. I've never used um, QPy before. Um, last time I did any thing with CUDA was with optics and the flow, I think. I was looking at Pi CUDA. How does do, do they do they talk at all? Does this uh, Pi CUDA and QPy does QPy replace Pi CUDA? Does it wrap around it? Does it um, interface with it, or do you know much about that, or is it just a standalone thing? No, actually, I started with Pi CUDA initially, but then I was missing a lot of functionalities in it. Like uh, they have NumPy support, but not. Uh, much with the existing SciPy ones. And uh, also with PyCuda, okay, it's very good to start if you are looking to write your own custom kernel, then you can just define with just-in-time compiler, uh, like Numba, and then do it. But apparently I found QPy to be a bit more advanced compared to PyCuda. And that's why I moved more for, with the QPy. Gotcha, so, so QPy effectively was a like a ready to use package, whereas PyCuda was more of an interface to CUDA itself. Yes. Awesome. No, that clarifies a lot. Uh, I've been meaning to get back into the CUDA space for a bit. So I might take at it. Thanks so much. Great question. And like I said, I'm going to stop the recording now, but I'm going to leave the Q&A open for a little while longer, just in case anybody has some questions and they're still typing.